Hello, everyone. Buenas noches. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the August 2023 Diversity and Inclusion Action Team call. This is our second call of the year. We're so excited to have you here. Uh, for those that are in the room, again, thank you for being um, here with us tonight. And for those who are recording, I uh, listening to the recording or watching this video, I hope that you um, place close attention and take time to do uh, some of the exercises we will talk about um, during the session. And I'll give the floor to Zach. Thank you, Karina. And good evening, everyone. And, you know, as was mentioned in the email that Karina sent out earlier, and uh, as you may have seen from the community page tonight, we will be talking about avoiding microaggressions and how to improve communication. And so this is, this is me, <laughs> and I'll, I'll make my introduction as short as humanly possible. I was, or I recently graduated from the University of Massachusetts Amherst with dual degrees in Afro-American studies and legal studies and time permitting, I'll show you them both at the end. And I will be going back at the end of this week, <laughs> actually, to, and school starts next week to start my full graduate year to gain a master's in public policy. So uh, hoping to be able to use the skills that I've learned here in this fellowship towards that public policy work and hopefully to create change in the world somehow, some way. Not entirely sure how, but we're figuring that out as we go. It's a little about me. And you know, I'd just like to take a moment of silence for the lives lost at UNC Chapel Hill and the lives lost at in Jacksonville this past week as well. So if we all could just take a moment of silence. Thank you. And so in terms of what we're gonna cover tonight, I kind of split them into three separate sections and I mean, you can read them for yourselves. And I mean, I can also, I'll also just read them for those that might not be able to see them as clearly. Uh, that first section is being uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, as it says for our white audience, you may be uncomfortable at certain points throughout the presentation, that is okay. And, you know, that is just in particular, uh, you know, geared towards any, any discussion of uh, race and racism or race and ethnicity and things of that nature. And feel free to pass to someone else if you don't wish to answer a question or if you don't wish to offer your perspective. And the next thing that we're gonna cover is moving away from generalizations. <laughs> and so, you know, ideally you wanna avoid them wholeheartedly, but uh, you know, if, if one does happen to come up, you move and gear towards using I statements, like, you know, instead of, uh, say, this particular group engaged in this particular behavior, I did X, Y, and Z uh, so many odd years ago, or what have you. And, you know, that last section being, you know, some more rules, uh, rules to follow, just a, a basic understanding of respect and care, as Karina mentioned at the top, you know, uh, we are, you know, we're all adults here. <laughs> and I think, you know, that the whole, the idea of the golden rule is definitely there. It, and it's funny, I actually read this in a book about two or three weeks ago at this point, if not longer, uh, that talks about the platinum rule. Instead of treating others how we want to be treated, in this case, it, you know, you could also treat others how they want to be treated. So if you see someone that's essentially asking for respect and care, kind of want to treat them that same way. And, you know, just this last point of Vegas rules. So ideally what happens in the Zoom room stays in the Zoom room and, you know, don't necessarily share any personal information outside of said Zoom room. All right, so now uh, just, you know, you can put your definition or your answer in the chat. And so the question is, what are microaggressions? And the subset to that question is, what is your definition of this word? So I'll give you all a couple of minutes to put definitions in the chat.
for those who are listening or uh, to the recording, people are defining microaggressions are as unintentionally ordering someone else. An interaction that seems light, but in reality has many hidden meanings. Someone said microaggression is a paper cut. One doesn't seem to matter in quotes, but a thousand of them will hurt deeply. Something that is said or done that may mean well. Usually unconscious and unintentional small moments of disrespect that for the recipient add up and pile up to cause stress and distress. Comments and behaviors related that make another person feel uncomfortable, bad, or off balance. Working or taking on basis of unjustified presumptions of privilege. That's very good. And another comment, comments that imply that someone doesn't belong, in quote, here. If anyone has any last minute things they'd like to throw in the chat, and then I will move to the next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. So my, a microaggression defined is a statement action or incident regarded as an instance of indirect, subtle, or unintentional discrimination against members of a marginalized group, such as a racial or ethnic minority. And then these are the different types of microaggressions that come up in different spaces. And, you know, of course, if there were a time permitting, I would go through each, each one, obviously not too in-depth, but in-depth enough that you could get it an understanding of them. But if you're wanting to know more, I'm happy to talk more after this. And now we're just going to go over some examples that have come up uh, both in, in and out of different parts of the organization. And so instead of me reading all these off, uh, I'm gonna give you all a few minutes to read these to yourselves. And then when enough of you, or when everyone is done reading, I can move on to the next slide. And as a reminder, these are examples that have come out of CCL directly. So. Couldn't fit them all in one slide, so I was like, why not just break them up? <laughs> Figured it might be easier that way.
and these are just a couple of video examples that I can further <laughs> emulate what those exam what those written examples were trying to propose. So if you give me one second, I might have to pop out a slideshow. Have you ever been in a situation at work where someone you know makes enough? The voice went away, Zach. Sorry. You want to restart? Oh, yeah. Have you ever been in a situation at work where someone you know makes an offensive remark about a coworker's identity? Hi, my name is Dr. You can't unmute your, oh, sorry. Hey, Zach, you can't unmute because you have to show your audio for your uh, your video. Or you could just share your audio. Right. Got it. In the, in the new share button, just hit new share. You don't have to unshare. And at the bottom left, hit share screen and then just submit again. Thank you. Have you ever been in a situation at work where someone you know makes an offensive remark about a coworker's identity? Hi, my name is Dr. Vanessa and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. One of the best ways you can show kindness in the workplace is to intervene when you witness a microaggression. Mm -hmm. The long-term psychological harm of microaggressions can lead to burnout, decreased job satisfaction, and even a hostile work climate. So if you see a microaggression, here are some tips for some things that you can do. Call people in, don't call people out. Explain how and why their words or actions are harmful. Differentiate between intent and impact. Emphasize that while the intent may not have been to offend, the impact on the person who is harmed is what matters. For more tips like this, be sure to check back here for more videos. Karina, I think that's a message saying it shouldn't be played. <laughs> All right, that's okay. What we'll do is we'll we'll leave that one for last. Yeah. And we'll just continue with the presentation. Basically, that video for everybody, like a little bit of background. We found a video where microaggressions, and, and it, we wanted to share as an example of like what if these microaggressions happen to white people, and someone had actually made a video. <laughs> so we'll show it to you when we get to the end of the discussion time. Go ahead. And so here comes the discussion portion, uh, whether it be in the chat or whether it be out loud, unmuted. And the question, as it says, is uh, where have you found examples of microaggressions at CCL? Go ahead. Go ahead. You're muting. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I was I was about to go into a lobby meeting um, with some people, and one of the people in our group was um, from an African nation originally, and um, the official language of that nation is English, and he got a compliment for how good his English is. I'll say that um, consistently every single conference, I'm mistaken for one of the two other East Asian women uh, in the in the in the organization. There's there's only like two or three like prominent ones, and so you would think it wouldn't be that hard. But uh, yes, it happened this last. But it happened this last time on like the third day, just when we, we, I almost thought it was going to be an entire conference without being mistaken. But no, they were really confident it was me too.
Go ahead, Ellie. Um, I was in a meeting uh, where someone made a joke, not a lobby meeting, but someone made a joke about uh, Columbus Day turning into Indigenous Peoples Day. And after the joke was, or while the joke was being made, I started to feel weird. And when it was all done, I thought to myself, I think that was a microaggression. And so I reached out to um, Karina and Stephanie and I said, I think this was a microaggression. And they were both like, uh, yeah, it was. We kind of tuned ourselves out once it started. And um, I was, so then I spoke to the person, I emailed the person who made the joke and I sent them some articles about <laughs> how jokes can be microaggressions and, um, uh, that and how that it made it difficult for those of us who perceived it as a microaggression to then fully be in that meeting because we had tuned it out. I mean, so that was my, my experience. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for sharing, Ali. No, no, go ahead, Manola. Uh, I I was told somebody that I was from Puerto Rico and their comment was, oh, you don't look like a Puerto Rican. And, <laughs> and I, usually when that happens, I confront the person and I say, okay, so what, what do you think a Puerto Rican is supposed to look like? Oh, you're bold. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, they don't want to tell you it's because they think they're supposed to be brown or black or whatever, you know. And they're like, oh, well, well I, I don't know, I, I don't know, I don't know. And, you know, and usually that's what they say. But I try to confront people to to teach them a lesson that that is not something that you say to somebody, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I've been I've been I've been told that I don't look like a Puerto Rican. And also I've been told that uh, if I am a citizen now because I married somebody from Kentucky, which that's just terrible because that just tells them that or tells me that they don't know anything about. Puerto Rico being part of the U.S. So, go ahead, Dolly. Um, I was in a training, actually a video training, where, and I think it was some kind of diversity training, where one of the participants actually said, "Well, black people are more criminal." Uh. Mm -mm. Oh, I don't think that's a microaggression. That's a macroaggression. <laughs> it's a comment like that, you know. It's terrible. There are different types of microaggressions that we haven't even begun to touch here. Man, that is that is. Some... Mm -hmm. What a comment. Yes, what a comment, Minerve. Yeah, I'd still say I I would relate to the well, getting comments about. Um, you know, I'm so surprised you're so well spoken and articulate. Like, what is that supposed to mean? Um, so yeah, those are pretty much the main ones. Or assuming that there's like a certain genre of music I like just because I'm black, but that's not that it's just a generalization. So yeah, that's also one of them I've encountered within CCL or automatically being um uh volunteered for, I guess something that has to do with um like um black culture when really we're not a monolith it's like okay there's you know someone might there's a specific demographic that might live in california and i'm the one that they look to to kind of solve the issue but that's not that's i'm from florida i don't know anything about california other than hollywood and movies and that's it so Go ahead, Manolo. I, I have an example, but it's not from CCL, it's from work. Sure. I was, they were talking about microaggressions and I, I mentioned a story I heard on a podcast of a female that was uh, African-American 
And she said that she was an engineering student and her, on her first year. And when she went to her classroom, the professor looked at her and said, I think you're in the wrong room without even checking, you know? And she, she asked what, what was the class? And he said, what the class was. And she said, yeah, I'm in the right room. And she sat down. And of course, the person that was talking about microaggressions told me at work that, oh, you know, you have to understand that not many women go into engineering and there's so many, uh, you know, African-Americans that go into engineering. And, you know, he started justifying the comment. And then uh, a female operator came into the room. She wasn't on the, com on the previous conversation. And she told us a story that when she was on her way to work that day, she is a veteran and she has a license plate that says woman veteran in the, in the back, you know, one of those license plates that said, you know, say you're a veteran. And she said that she was with her cousin and somebody that was pumping next to her came to her cousin and thanked him for, for his service, assuming that he was the veteran and not her. And she's telling us this story. And the person that said, you know, that the, that the female that was studying engineering uh, needed to suck it up and all that. I said, hey, JG, why don't you tell Cindy that she needs to suck it up? It's not a big deal that most, most veterans are, are males and all that. And the guy, his face just dropped. He didn't know what to say or what to do. He said, well, you know, that's, that's not right. That's not right because there are female and male veterans and blah, blah, blah. And, and this is BS. And, and I said, oh, okay. So when you have somebody in front of you, it's a, it's a complete different tune that he was he was playing, you know. But I, I thought it was pretty funny that he he didn't dare to say anything to her face about that microaggression. Thanks for sharing. I'm like as as I'm listening to everybody share like the stories, like I'm I'm thinking of the ones that have happened to me, and I'm like mine are mild, <laughs> and I call it mild because it's is the one thing that you don't think about. Like my first CCL conference, I was confused for the help. Someone actually asked me whether, you know, I could, I could help them get some food. And I'm sitting there like, I am one of the attendees. Like, I, well, okay. I'm like, I'm thinking the thing is over there. <laughs> um, but it's not the first time. Like I've been to other conferences in other locations and it's, it happened to me numerous times. Um, and it's just, um, yeah, exactly, Debbie. The paper cut, it does feel mild. I've heard other stuff, but you know, after a while, um, and I'm gonna say this as you know, as my in my point of view, because I've heard this all of my life since I've lived in the States. After a while, you just learn how to take these, and I choose to ignore. Now, that doesn't mean that that's not painful. It's just that I rather just not deal with it, you know, because I could go down the rabbit hole of like that person is ignorant, or that person doesn't know me, or that person has a different type of lifestyle than I do. I mean. Literally, I can spend my hour going down the rabbit hole of like, why did that person said that to me? And for what reason? And all it does, it just causes me stress. Michael questions are, are a health issue. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that, that's what I will contribute to this conversation. Anyone else wants to share before we continue? Jack, go ahead, Jack. Reacting to your uh, comments, Karina, I I remember from uh, uh, workshops about uh, unlearning racism that uh, it's very important whatever uh, the person who is has been targeted, however mm -hmm. they respond, uh, should be accepted as is perfectly fine. It's because you could it, it could be a pile on if you expect that the person who is targeted to have to respond at all or respond in one way or another. Uh, and so I, I fully endorse the idea that it's up to you, the individual. And it's 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 a shame that these instances happen, and it's great that uh, it's a topic of conversation that uh, so many of us, especially uh, in you know in um, majority cultures uh, need to learn how to deal uh, with the multicultural and changing uh, communities we have. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is uh, one big reason we have uh, pronouns that we give nowadays is the trans community. 
And I think that uh, I've been witness to situations uh, where a trans person that I'm not trans, but uh, where an assumption was made about whether they were he or she based on the, their appearance. Uh, and I do, I have noticed that it can be handled with such grace uh, by a person uh, who is a target. Uh, you know, granted, they, they don't need to respond at all, but uh, many people do want to learn uh, and, and conform their behavior to be more sensitive to people. Uh, and so being able to, uh, in this one instance, uh, the person was corrected and immediately apologized. And so both of them were able to go on with uh, the conversation at hand rather than get uh, into a, an extended conversation about what just happened. So it's, it's an interesting situation with trans people and uh, we're all learning uh, the importance of pronouns uh, with respect to them. Thank you so much for sharing that. Stephanie. Yeah, I'll try to keep it brief because I, I know, Zach, you have a lot more you want to share, I'm sure. Um, great job so far, by the way. <laughs> um, I wanted to share one because it's not kind of one of those axes of difference that we've touched on so far. Um, but ageism is definitely a thing. And as Minerva, you were sharing about being told about how well-spoken you are, I can't help but think that part of that is also that you're a very well-spoken young person, as I've often been told. Um, at CCL and in other places like, oh, I'm just so impressed with how well-spoken and knowledgeable and intelligent our young people are. Um, and I want to share that mostly because like that's something that I've heard my whole life and to the point of this being, you know, paper cuts, but how they add up. I can tell you now that I am slowly starting to not identify with the young person identity. It has called into question, like, what is my value if I'm no longer a young person? I was impressive then, but now I'm just a mediocre adult, right? So that's the power of language um, with our young people and with all people of diverse backgrounds. If you center their identity as a thing of value, everything else starts to fall away. I felt that, Stephanie. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> it reminded me of something I went a while back. Okay. Yes. Okay, I'm going to go turn off the thing because I got emotional for a second. Zach, I'll give you the floor. Thank you all for sharing. And <laughs> I apologize. I might get a little emotional here myself. Uh, you know, quite a few of the examples that were written uh, in the previous slides came from you know, some of my experiences at this past June conference, but as well as experiences that you know have been told to me and have been shared. And it's it's one of those things where, you know, uh, for someone that identifies clearly as black, obviously I can't take this off. <laughs> um, but uh, but that someone that is black, that is queer, that has disabilities, uh, that you know, encompasses all of these identities going into predominantly white spaces for me has not been easy and I and yet I mean I, I do it not necessarily because I want to but you know I do it because I feel as though I I need to make the space better I need to make the space safer for those that come after me and I often ask myself why <laughs> you know why I kind of torture myself by going into these spaces why I decided to stay at my predominantly white institution for graduate school instead of going to a HBCU or somewhere else or even going abroad and I <laughs> Zach could you connect yourself a little bit closer to the mic Sorry. And it's thank and you, it, of course, uh, and it's largely because it's the devil I know, <laughs> and that might feel like a cop out, and in some cases it is, but it's it's the truth. It's the devil I know, and it's 
it's it's because I'm familiar with those surroundings and it's because I know the players and I know the game you know going into a new space it takes me a while to figure out what the game is it takes me a while to really understand how I can conduct myself and you know where I need to code switch where I where I don't and how how to how to really do that on a day-to-day basis and it's exhausting (laughs) even tonight I was thinking about how to present this information and I was like, okay, so am I gonna have to uh, like, am I gonna have to put on my professional voice, or am I, or can I keep it a buck, and can I keep it real? And that is one of those tight ropes that I walk almost every day. <laughs> and you know, I, I don't do it because I want to. I do it because I have to. Because it's literally about my survival. And yeah, and I. I don't know. It's it's mostly about trying to make change as profound as possible in, in a lot of these spaces for me. So thank you all for sharing. Truly. Hey Zach, before we continue, Debbie wanted to offer a comment. Yeah, thanks. Um I was thinking about what you said, Zach, and, and one of the other um activists that I've spoken to, a woman of color, she said something similar to what you're saying about needing to do the work. And, and I think I was talking, I was reading about how, you know, sometimes we, people of privilege really like being comfortable. I know I love being comfortable. I don't usually put myself in uncomfortable situations. And I was asking her, I was like, doesn't everybody want to do that? And she said, no, I don't have that option. If I want to do this work, I'm, I'm basically always uncomfortable. Like it's, it's not a choice for her to be comfortable or uncomfortable. Whereas I can really easily choose to not put myself in uncomfortable situations. So it was kind of an eye-opening reality that not everyone gets that choice to be uncomfortable or comfortable. Thanks. Go ahead, Zach. Thanks for sharing, Debbie. Thank you, Deb. <clears throat> See you next. Okay, so what comes next <laughs> and you know obviously all of these things can come in various forms and fashion and you know of course there's no real order to any of this but when I thought about this particular slide I you know and I talked to Karina about this too just thinking about what 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 comes after these tough conversations what comes excuse me how do you how do you engage with people beyond the beyond the back and forth, so to speak, beyond the sense of saying this this thing hurt and this is why and it's oh I'm sorry I I'm sorry you felt hurt by that but how do you go deeper and you know and these were just <laughs> honestly the first things that came to my mind and yeah I think. A lot of it is truly about the willingness to be uncomfortable (laughs) both with oneself and with the conversation or with the presentation or what have you and sitting with that and really I guess understanding you know what what that looks like going forward. And <laughs> this is a quote that I first heard, I want to say my first year of college, which <laughs> I'm going to age myself a little here, uh, five years ago. <laughs> uh, feels so long ago, and yet this resonates with me so much. And I'm just going to read it and, you know, take with it Take from it what you you will. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support each other. And we have nothing to lose but our chains. And that quote comes from Asada Shakur. She is a revolutionary, former Black Panther Party member, former member of the I'm so gonna botch this. And I and I read about her in one of my college classes. 
but I believe it was the either the African Revolutionary Movement or something along those lines. And, I, and I'm so sorry, Sada, I'm watching that. Uh, and, you know, I, I thought of that quote just because it's something that feels like it resonates, especially when having conversations like this, especially when in spaces like the space we are tonight, even though we're over Zoom, and even though this is a heavy topic, I feel like a quote like this kind of rounds it out nicely, in a sense. And it allows us to truly connect with each other in a way that you know, we might not get to do otherwise. So I just wanted to take a moment and you know find something that spoke, spoke to me, but it hopefully speaks to you all as well, in a way. And these are just some questions that I had for you all. And so uh, you all can either, you can, you can ruminate on these answers. You can put some of the answers in the chat. You can unmute, feel free to do uh, whatever makes you feel comfortable. You can also take these questions and write yourself a very wonderful essay. <laughs> I thought about things like this too. <laughs> I was gonna say that, but I I figured <laughs> I, I figured it'd be better coming from you or <laughs> no worries, no worries. I've got you. I'm also looking at the time. Rachel. I actually have kind of a story in a way to um help counteract that. And when at times when as white people have like myself have messed up, it's okay to, you know, to counteract by apologizing and also asking questions. Um, because for me specifically, um, the story is, is I was at a, a party for a friend that was a goodbye party. Uh, the person, um, individual is trans and I accidentally called their at birth uh, pronoun and not their pronoun they are transitioned to. Um, and so I called her him when it was a her. Um, and I specifically said that to someone I overheard in a conversation and I froze up and didn't say anything and that was my fault. Um, so, you know, and later on now, you know, just counteract when I make a mistake to follow up with that person right away because at the end of the day, it's better to ask questions rather than to just leave it hanging there in my opinion. Um, and I've continued like learn from my own mistakes with with other situations and try not to freeze up or when I'm angry, upset when people say stuff to my husband who is black. And so um, it's a very interesting, um, a very good learning uh, spot for me to be at. So thank you. Excuse me, sorry. And these are just some last takeaways. I, I just had to look at what time it was, so I apologize for running over. <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm, I'll just read a couple of them to you. I, I won't have to read them all. But you know, as, as the first one says, microaggressions are bad. And I, I feel like I feel like that's kind of self-explanatory, but at the same time, just you know, just take stock of that and like really truly understand that <laughs> if they're bad and you know another one just be willing to unlearn harmful stereotypes and narratives and yeah it's one of those things where you know you make the mistake but you have to be willing to do the work in order to ensure that you don't continuously make that mistake and that's the thing about life it's a journey it's not really a marathon or it's not it's not a sprint it's a marathon <laughs> That is oh yes, and before I forget, uh, September sixteenth, which is about three weeks, right? Yeah, in about three weeks, uh, our inclusion conference is coming up, and so shout out to Karina 
and the members of the inclusion team for putting that together. And in particular, shout out to Minerve for hounding all, all the speakers for real, for real. Uh, <laughs> you did that. And so, yeah, it is from 1 to 6.30. And as you can see, the reception is Friday night at 7. So tell your friends, tell your family members, come through, show up, and you will most likely be getting reminders from Karina or from other members of CCL National to come through. Um, there it is. <laughs> I was, I was like, wait. I'm waiting on your final words. <laughs> hey, wait, is this thing not working? <laughs> And so thank you all for coming. And as you can see, that is my email as well as the inclusion email. If you have any questions, if you'd like to have follow-up conversations or uh, if you'd just like to chat, then thank you again. Links in the chat for the action team and for the conference. Thank you so much, Debbie. And thank you so much, Zach. Thank you, Zach. Um, Thank you. Before I let you go, just a reminder that we're not meeting next month because we will be busy with the race and culture conversation at the end of September. And of course, the inclusion conference, as Zach mentioned. Um, let us know what you would like to learn. So in October, when we meet again, we will have a discussion about political diversity. It's going to be quite interesting. I have enlisted my colleague our conservative director, uh, Drew Ierly. So him and I are gonna have a conversation with all of you about how we see political diversity at our organization and how we work together. So I invite you to uh, join us next month. I mean, in October. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at the Inclusion Conference.